Welcome to the Beltway Broadcast, the premier podcast for the workplace learning and talent development professionals of the Association for Talent Development's Metro DC chapter. We've got some great resources in store for you today. Hello, fellow ATDers. I'm Stephanie Hupka, the 2023 Vice President of Membership and Outreach and a member of the Pod Squad here at the Metro DC chapter of ATD. Hi, I'm Christina Eanes, the Vice President of Marketing and Communications. We also have Helena Hodges, our Vice President of Finance and Operations, as our producer. And for this episode, we are thrilled to welcome Dr. Paul Zach. Welcome, Paul. Woohoo! I'm happy to be here. <laughs> My favorite welcome of all time, I think. I'm thrilled you're here. I'm actually thrilled we're going to be getting into our topic of the day, which is the neuroscience of trust, a huge one, an important one. But before we do, we would love it if you would introduce yourself to all of our listeners. Oh, I'm a professional nerd, a uh, longtime <laughs> ATP -er. Um, I'm a professor at Claremont Graduate University and started the first neuroscience as a service platform mm -hmm. called Immersion, which allows anybody to measure what the brain loves in real time. Oh, wow. I am excited to learn a whole lot more about that. Although I feel like for today, we might want to start a little bit, maybe more at a higher level or so. So we're talking about neuroscience and trust. And for a lot of us, I think that's one of those lean in kinds of topics because trust has such a huge impact on the workplace, how you feel that you connect with people, how you feel engaged. So I would love to start there. Tell me a little bit about how trust makes a difference on a team or maybe even more broadly within an organization. Great question. So let's start with kind of the basics, which is our human brain is designed to interact with others. Mm -hmm. So putting a bunch of strangers in a building and have them work together, or remotely for that matter, totally natural for us. It's not unnatural. So if you remember um, Economics 101, they called this the disutility of labor, which means work sucks so bad, we gotta pay you, monitor you. <laughs> you know, we like what we do, right? If we found our niche, like we kind of dig it. And we're like, hey, they pay me for this, it's awesome. Um, so that's the first thing, let's let's get rid of that yeah, kind of skepticism. Now, not every part of work is awesome, for sure. So how do we make work more awesome? How do we have teams and organizations perform at a higher level? The first is how we organize the humans. And so a lot of the work from, from my lab and a couple others have shown that trust is an essential component to effective teamwork, right? If I don't think Christina is gonna cooperate with me, man, I don't wanna, she's just gonna slow me down. Like I don't wanna be around her, but when everyone's integrated in, I trust her, she trusts me, we have this nice working relationship. Um, then we can be much more efficient. So think of trust as kind of a lubricant. Right? So humans are together, there'd be some frictions and trust is like a lubricant to that. So let's go one step backward and one step forward. The precursor to trust is psychological safety, mm -hmm. right? If I'm in this group of people and I feel like, man, these people are gonna stab me in the back or they're, you know, then I'm um, neurologically that inhibits the underlying uh, brain network that says I, I can trust this person. So we first gotta establish psychological safety uh, we develop physiologic measures of that. So that can be measured in real time, second by second, by applying data to smartwatches um, that we've done. Then the second is, how do I facilitate trust? And so in my 2017 book, Trust Factor, we identified eight core factors that underlie the behaviors that sustain trust in teams. And then going one step forward, we show that high trust teams are much more effective on lots of different levels, more innovative more productive, more mm -hmm. satisfied with their jobs, yeah. lower turnover, um, keep going down the list, fewer sick days. Um, and the fact people work in high trust organizations are actually more satisfied with their lives outside of work. Yeah. So they're better spouses, parents, no citizens, kidding. they're not getting beat up at work all the time. That makes sense. Isn't that amazing? That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So you've mentioned neuroscience and I love anything to do with learning more about how our brains work. So what is happening in the brain in regards to trust? So we discovered uh, starting in the late 1990s is that a neurochemical called oxytocin is released when we get signals from a stranger or someone we know, but generally from a stranger, that that person appears to be safe or trustworthy. So we ran many, many experiments in which people interacted with strangers and they could cooperate, share money, share a task. And so this signal uh, is not a zero one signal, it's a continuous signal. So 
you guys are awfully nice. And if we met, and right now I'm probably releasing some oxytocin, but if my little daughters come in the room, Aww. much bigger, right? Yeah, so it indexes sure. the degree of trust. So for listeners, the, the value of knowing the underlying neurochemical and the induced electrical signals associated with that neurochemical change is that we can very precisely ask, what are the factors that inhibit or promote mm-hmm. the release of oxytocin and therefore trust in the people around me? So let's do a couple of those real quickly. Sure. Inhibitors, high levels of stress. Mm-hmm. Moderate stress promotes oxytocin release. So if I have a goal, I know where I'm going. I've got milestones. I want to pull on those social resources. Hey, Christina, you know what? Uh, you know, gosh, we had this, some little run in a couple of weeks ago. I'm so sorry about that. Look, I got We got to work together on this project. We got to get it done. So functionally, that looks like trust. Mm-hmm. Again, I'm in the behavior world, not in the feeling world. Mm-hmm. You still think like, like, oh, I'm not sure about this guy, Paul, but <laughs> functionally, you that's trust and my performance goes up. Another interesting factor that inhibits trust, which won't surprise you perhaps, is high levels of testosterone. Mm. So who are the most, so testosterone is about making you a little god. Who are the most um, self-indulgent, godlike humans on the planet? <laughs> Teenage boys, which- <laughs> I knew you're going there. <laughs> but in organizations in which you have a lot of competition, that drives up testosterone. When you get a promotion at work, your males and females, your testosterone mm-hmm. goes up. You know, testosterone is higher in males, so the you know you see the the examples bigger. So what this means is that sort of rank and yank old um, you know GE um, approach is stupid, mm-hmm. right? I don't want to have in group competition. I want to have in-group cooperation, out-group. I want that out, you know, the the competitor to drive us to be better, but I want to be like trying to save my job. And, you know, Enron, people start faking the data, right? So that's not good. Mm, yeah. So for listeners, we want a more horizontal structure. We want to all work together. If you lead a team and you're showing up in a $10,000 Armani suit, you're just displaying status symbols. And we're like, you're, that, that person's not one of the team. You're not a team player, right? So Dress the same in my organizations. I always take the worst job first. Hmm. We're going to do gross stuff. Sign me up. Nice. I'm your guy. Right. Mm-hmm. So I want to show that we're all on the same team together. Right. So no matter what your job is, you're essential. And so let's, you know, support these individuals. Okay. Lastly, what promotes uh, oxytocin release? It's really thinking about bringing your authentic self to work. Right. So there's no work you and personally, there's just you. Yeah. So once we accept that we are who we are, and from a neuroscience perspective, it means that people around me, my colleagues, are not going to be consistent, right? They're going to be tired. They're going to be hungry. There's 200 neurochemicals. Mm-hmm. You know, your brain's living in this weird soup that you don't even know about. <laughs> so people are going to have good days and bad days. And so I can build that by building relationships, by being vulnerable myself, being open, being honest, being transparent. All the things that say, hey, look, you're part of my community. You're part of my team. I'm going to be exactly who I am normally. Mm -hmm. So um, leaders can really set the pace to drive up trust and therefore drive up performance. Mm -hmm. And just think of the the downside. And I've had this kind of boss. You guys probably have too. The yelling boss, Mm -hmm. my least favorite Mm -hmm. boss. Yeah. He's stressed out because some happens. Always a he in my case. (laughs) (laughs) You're not screaming at me. Mm -hmm. I don't respond to screaming. It's like, Dude, mm-hmm. get a hold of yourself. Now, am I <laughs> yeah. going to do anything innovative? Am I going to try? If if I'm going to get screamed at if something goes south, no. But if Sorry. I want innovation, I have to accept mistakes, right? Mm-hmm. Innovations are positive deviations. Mistakes are negative deviations. So I've got to build this high trust environment if I want people to innovate, to take ownership of what they're doing, to really move our organization's performance forward. You've mentioned a couple of things that have made me smile one of which is the idea that you don't have to have two different personalities. Yes. I've often <laughs> joked that I am the same person. I don't have a work-life balance necessarily because I don't have time to manage all of those personalities. <laughs> and so I, I just sort of am who I am. But you also mentioned oxytocin. And when you mentioned oxytocin, the first thing I thought of is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart, which is storytelling. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious if you have any information or thoughts on the connection between storytelling as a strategy, a way to build connection, a way to release oxytocin and trust. Look at you, Stephanie. I am super <laughs> famous in the neuroscience of storytelling. So what we have found is that if 
I want to influence other people, oxytocin is not enough. We also need an mm -hmm. attentive response associated mm -hmm. with the brain's production of dopamine binding in the prefrontal cortex. So I've got to yep. be attentive. I've got to be present. And yeah. the, the oxytocin response is what I call emotional resonance. Mm -hmm. Can I use one bad word? Of course. Of My course. Um, so one of our subscribers to the software we developed called this the give a shit measure. <laughs> get it, get I love it. Right? So <laughs> capture my attention and then get me to care about it emotionally. Yeah. If you do both those things, then you can influence me. Yeah. And the most effective way to sustain immersion and therefore influence people is to tell a story. So what is a story? Introduces characters, a setting, and then it has some kind of crisis or difficulty that these characters have to work out. That building tension in a story draws us in as emotional social creatures. We want to find out what happens to these individuals. So take away for listeners, always lead with a story. Absolutely. Even if your presentation, even if your keynote is about something technical, lead with a human scale story in which you have real emotions, authentic emotions, where people who are using whatever you're going to talk about to solve their problem. That's the best case of this story. Not just some oddball story. Hey, when I was five years old, I rode my bike. <laughs> I don't care. But we had a customer who had this very unusual problem that wanted to use our product to solve it. And we weren't sure it would solve it. And the problem was this customer's company was about to go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. So if they didn't solve this problem, they were out. Now, should I spend any money, time, effort, selling this customer that's likely going to go bankrupt on our product, we weren't sure. But you know what? We know this guy. He's a great guy. And so we said, you know what? We're going to try to make this work for you. And guess what happened? His company closed a huge sale and now they're going like gangbusters. And so, you know, so I just made that story up, right? This is I so love it. I want to know more. <laughs> more specifically, the better. If I use that person's name, if I use the company name, so yeah. really tangible because we all understand stories and we're all natural storytellers. But as Stephanie would say, we're not all equally good at telling stories. Yeah. So <laughs> what do you know about like theater and movie? Rehearse. If, if you yeah. want to make an impact, rehearse. And I would also say measure, right? We have technologies. Let's measure this neurologic immersion state. When I'm immersed, you can move me, mm. right? And I'm like, Absolutely. oh, this is the most important thing I've heard for the last three hours. I got to do this thing. Yeah. So once you've immersed people, then you can ask them to do something. You have a call to action, just like in marketing. But it also works for keynotes, for team leadership. For anything. Yeah. No. It does. Yeah. Podcast it does. It's the most interviews. powerful tool we've got. <laughs> well, really, all we have is, is influence. We, mm -hmm. we want to ask people. And I think in the world we're in now where we're running out of humans, right, record low unemployment rates. Now, we've had some, some layoffs, this inflation stuff. Yeah. but. Yeah. You know, in the last five years, even with COVID, very low unemployment. There's no more babies, right? Babies mm -hmm. are disappearing around the world. Every place but Africa and Africa starts to age around um, 10 years from now. So yeah. we've got to care for the humans that we have. Yeah. And that means we've got to make work a place where people can grow professionally, can feel satisfied personally. And I think that really is tapping into this important information flow, which is people's emotional states, Yeah. right? So if you treat me like a jerk, it's going to be really hard for me to trust you. Absolutely. By the way, whether I work with you, where I'm married to you, whether you're my friend, right? It's yeah. all the same pathway in the brain, right? Mm -hmm. So you keep treating me like a jerk. I'm going to be watching my watch and go, man, five o'clock. I got to get the hell out of here. As Absolutely opposed to, right. I dig this job. Like, these are some awesome people. We are changing the world. Like, oh my God, it's 730. Like, you know, yeah. like yesterday, I work a 15 hour day. Like, because I had to? No, I was turned on. I was digging it. I was like, you wanted yeah. to. I was like, yeah. grinding it out. This is awesome. And my yep. team is amazing. I love these people. Uh -huh. it, I love that. Which brings to mind uh, a, a term that you had mentioned in one of your articles. Uh, and I hadn't heard of it before. So return on trust. Mm. What does that mean? Yeah. Can you share that with our listeners? Yeah, exactly. So what is the kind of delta that I get from investing often very little money or resources or time to improve trust. So as you guys know from, from the stuff I've written, you know, we've identified these kind of eight core factors that form the foundation for trust within organizations. We can measure those. We've developed a way to measure those with the survey, which means if I can measure them, I can intervene and improve them. Mm. So that says that for this small investment, time or money or both, then I can get the kind of delta on that. So let me give you a, a concrete example. Mm -hmm. So we've worked with a lot of organizations 
including police departments. So just like there's no babies, no one's going into policing yeah. for lots of reasons. Yeah, yeah that's right. Big recruiting issues. So the people they have working for them, they want to keep working for them. And yet turnover is high in the first couple of years. And so we work with the police department in California, measure trust, found particularly the, the younger patrol officers to have very low trust in the organization. Mm. and really didn't see us a place for them to stay for too long. And we developed with the chief of police, a job shadowing program. So you spent a day, instead of driving around your car with your boss's boss. Mm -hmm. So that's normally a lieutenant, sometimes a captain. So you know your sergeant, who's your direct boss, if you're a patrol officer. What does the boss's boss do? Mm -hmm. And then we worked with that boss's boss and the chief of police to have specific questions that that lieutenant would ask this patrol officer. Hey, you know, what do you think about this? Hey, let me show you how I do this thing. And guess what? Trust went up mm. for the people who participated in the program but compared to the control group who did not. Their job satisfaction went up and their desire to stay or likelihood of staying with a job in the next 12 months went way up. Wow. Right. So it's really kind of spending the time to build these relationships so that you are a valuable human being. You have your own feelings and emotions and personal life, and you're not a means to an end. You're not, I hate the word worker. It seems so yeah. Marxist to me. Widgets. You're a worker. <laughs> you're a member. You're a colleague. Yes. Right. We're, we're all in this together. Yeah. yeah. I think it can be very easy for people to forget that. And in fact, I'm thinking about some of the conversations that I've had with colleagues of mine. I am a consultant, so I you know, spend most of my time working with others, but they're all part of much bigger teams. And one of the themes that came out, especially toward the beginning of the pandemic, was the concept of trust. And a big part of that was because many people who work together in person were no longer together in person. They're dispersed. They're working sometimes in different ways different hours. We have competing responsibilities. Now it was a very different world. And one of the uh, conversations that I had with a number of people was how they felt like their bosses didn't trust yeah. them. There were different check-ins, more check-ins. And I'm wondering, because in some cases, I feel as though we're not quite past that for some organizations and maybe for some relationships. What does it look like to build trust, perhaps in environments where people are dispersed or, it, you know, it might be hybrid, it might be remote? Does it change as far as how you might build trust if you're with people and you see them and you experience being in that environment with them all the time? That's such a great question. And my new book, Immersion, um, actually has a bunch of data on that mm. because it was written, you know, during the COVID times. And so we had mm. data pre and post lockdown. Um, so you're right. I think we really transitioned into much more hybrid work for almost all of us. And um, that this 2D screen we're on, you know, lacks the kind of bandwidth we get when I see one person, I can give you a hug, I can make eye contact, you know, whatever that is, um, which really builds that oxytocin release and trust. You know, it's just easier. We have those random collisions in the office, right? Where we just, now we have to schedule a meeting, you know, yeah. with time, I got a hard. meeting on the hour. Yeah. It's not as kind of natural for social creatures. So um, yes, we're saving money in office space. Um, yes, we're, we're saving time not commuting, but the downside is we're not really building those strong relationships as easily. So what's the solution? Um, I'm a big believer in not fighting fair. I want to fight unfair. So, you know, uh, we don't want to, I think it's bad to force people to be in the office, but we can incentivize them to come in. How about lunchtime? Mm. So, you know, I've been at Google a ton of times, those long tables that you have your quote free lunch. And every time I'm there, it's a giant company, right? And so people were taking me to lunch because I'm giving a talk or something. They meet other folks. Oh, you're in that machine learning group. Oh yeah, what are you guys doing? So that kind of random uh, meeting. So for companies that want to get people in the office, how about, you know, lunch and have a small interval and have nice long tables where people have to mix. It's not from, you know, 1130 to two. No, it's going to be from 12 to 1245. You got to show up all the same time, right? Have that bonding experience. Eating is very relaxing, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, how about uh, beer and pizza after work on Friday, five o'clock, 5 p.m.? Uh, Friday, 5 p.m., we have beer and pizza. That'll get people in the office, right? So if you look at where people show up, it tends to be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but, you know, Friday, Monday, they're not so much. So don't fight fair. How about um, on-site daycare? Dogs in the office, mm. right? Thanks to all these kind of things that you kind of have at home. I got my beautiful doggy lying on my feet here. Aww. makes me happy. I could bring them in the office. <laughs> they love me. Um, and so that's the upside. By the way, the, oh, sorry, the, 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 the you know, sort of incentives. The upside yeah. of uh, working at home, though, is greater autonomy, which is one of this, the factors yeah. that drives up trust. 
Right? So I'm in the office and this your boss is looking over my shoulder or forces me to come in a couple of days a week or whatever. Then it's like, dude, you're micromanaging me. Like, I'm a pro. I know what I'm doing. Yeah. I will grind it out. Don't be looking over my shoulder and don't be screaming at me for sure. So yeah. that's all going to go away. <laughs> so I think the autonomy we have at work and even pre-COVID, the data suggested that people who worked at home worked about an extra hour a day compared to wow. people in the office. Because the lack of chit chat, going to lunch, you know, the driving. All that. And so I think we should kind of think about hybrid as the new normal, mm. but you've got to be in the office sometime. So even if you have a remote team, if you're a leader, I would say spend some time, get on an airplane. You've got to spend physical time with these humans if you're going to lead them effectively, because not seeing you just erodes that connection, that trust, and that desire to really knock it out of the park. I mean, again, I'm always in the neuroscience realm. It takes a lot of effort, cognitive effort and emotional effort, right, to really perform at the highest levels. I will do that if my team depends on me, they trust me, and I know why the hell I'm doing this. So I call it purpose. But just to <laughs> right. say, how do we change the world? What is what is my organization doing that makes the world a better place? People are very motivated by purpose, but it's got to be a lived purpose. And purpose and trust feed back on each other. Hmm. Oh, I love that. Now, before we get to the rapid fire questions, I know folks are going to want to learn more. They're going to want to dive deeper into this. So for our listeners and viewers, can you maybe share like a, I don't know, 60 to 90 second commercial on your products and or services and how they can get a hold of them? Um, sure. Um, you can find me at getimmersion.com. So we, uh, as I said, developed the first neuroscience as a service platform that pulls data from smartwatches and fitness sensors mm -hmm. to measure what your brain loves in real time, applied to marketing. We have a lot of clients in the corporate training space. I'll be at ATD in San Diego uh, in May. Awesome. So make sure we get to hang out while we're there, uh, giving a talk exactly on EX to CX. So if we really want extraordinary experiences for our customers, it's employees who have to create them. So how do we actually make that connection? And stage one is measurement. I got to measure what matters, and that is my emotional connection to this experience as an employee that I'm having. Um, and the training applications, excuse me, are really, really interesting. So um, anyway, I'll be talking about that in May. Get immersion.com and my new book, randomly called Immersion. Who knew? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's extraordinary in the source of happiness. There's a whole chapter on creating extraordinary employee experiences, mm. which to me, can be, if you could measure it, you can improve it. Yes. So anyway, that's what I'm doing with my copious spare time in my life. <laughs> copious spare time. <laughs> Even better. Even better. <laughs> oh, okay. So at the end of every episode, we ask three rapid fire questions that don't require too long of a response. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Now, of course, in addition to your books, especially the latest <laughs> one, what is one book that everyone must read and why? Besides my own books, my favorite business book is The Experience Economy by Pine and Gilmore. Mm -hmm. Really talks about taking insights from theater to practice and create extraordinary experiences mm -hmm. for clients and for employees. I love it. Awesome. Okay. Uh, what is one tool, and you can define that however you would like, that you cannot live without? Yeah, I'm a tool developer. So we're currently developing a tool to measure emotional fitness in real time neurologically wow. at work. So very predictive of things like depressive symptoms, when people should use resiliency and wellness resources. So um, I've created a lot of tools. This is really my favorite. If I can't choose my own, then my second will be Calendly. Calendly changed my life. It's crap time. Time zone change. You know, it's crazy. I love it. I love Calendly too. What is the name of the tool that you are developing? It's called Flourish. Flourish. It's not released yet, but it measures in real time your emotional wellness. And, you know, it's so important as, again, as we get fewer and fewer employees, um, we've got to be, keep people emotionally fit. So this is a muscle. You can develop your resiliency and emotional fitness, but you got to measure it. Nice. Absolutely so people right. can watch getimmersion.com for that? Getimmersion.com. You'll see lots of info cool. there. Okay. Uh, final question, rapid fire question. What is the best piece of advice you've ever received? It's going to sound very odd, but as an undergraduate in a finance class, uh, the professor there said, always pay yourself first. Mm. 
Now, when you say that superficially, that, that sounds really, really selfish. But it's the same thing as put on your oxygen mask before you help somebody else. Yeah. So be, he was saying because of the magic of compounding, right? You can delay paying your utility bill for a couple of months, but if you keep investing, you get all that compounding, which is uh, just a magical way. Mm. But I think it's the same thing here. If I'm if I'm not physically, emotionally, and maybe spiritually healthy, I'm not a good leader. Yeah. I'm not a good team member. So first of all, get enough sleep, exercise, uh, you know, have a decent diet, um, you know, take care of yourself so you can take care of people around you your family, your colleagues. Um, and lastly, you know, we have found that individuals who have an avocation, so besides work and family, mm -hmm. what are you doing that just gives you energy, that makes the planet a better place? Mm -hmm. And if you lean into that avocation, you get so much more energy at work, you get so much more happiness at home. So ultimately it's about how to build our quality of life. Um, and so to do that, yeah, you got to invest in what's most important, which is firstly you. Yeah. Oh, what incredible advice, yes. really. And I think something we all need to take to heart and remember and, you know, really bring into our day to day and the decisions we make. And a lot of that, I think, leads us back to how we're able to build connections and trust with others. So what a wonderful way to wrap mm. us up today. Paul, this has been such a fun conversation. We are thrilled that you had some time to chat with us today. Oh, it was great. You guys are the best. So um, I'll see you at ATD in May. I hope Absolutely. it's in Diego. You will certainly see us at ATD. And of course, a big thank you to all of you for listening today. And before you go, we have a message from our producer, Helena Hodges. Are you interested in partnering with our chapter? For more information, visit dcatd.org forward slash partnerships dash sponsorships. Check out dcatd.org for upcoming chapter events, learning programs, member benefits, and so much more. Mm -hmm.